Welcome back to .NET IoT for Beginners. In this video, we're exploring analog to digital converters, also called ADCs, like this little guy, the MCP3008. ADCs play a crucial role in translating continuous analog signals, such as sound or temperature, into discrete digital data that computers and other devices can store, transmit, and analyze. Let's dive in. The MCP3008 uses the SPI, or Serial Peripheral Interface, bus. SPI works a little differently from I2C, but we don't really need to know the details since the .NET IoT libraries handle that for us. All I need to do is make sure I've enabled SPI on my Pi. To show how an analog to digital converter converts analog signals to digital values, I'll use a potentiometer. A potentiometer is a variable resistor. It has three terminals. The middle pin is called the wiper pin, and its output is variable. The two outer terminals are called ends. The ends are connected to positive and ground. As the knob is turned, the resistance inside the potentiometer changes and attenuates the voltage on the wiper pin. I'm going to build a circuit to display the resistance of the potentiometer as a percentage. I've got my MCP3008 on my breadboard already. I'll start by connecting my Pi's 3.3 volt pin and ground pins to the power rail on the breadboard. Then I'll connect the VDD pin to positive. This powers the MCP3008. I'll also connect the VREF pin to positive. This is the reference voltage. At runtime, the MCP3008 will compare the voltage from this pin to the input pin and assign a value from 0 to 1023. Next, I'll connect the analog ground pin to ground. Then it's time to hook up the SPI pins. They correspond to pins on my Pi. I'll start with the clock pin, then I'll connect the D out pin to the Pi's MI or master input pin and the D in pin to the Pi's MO or output pin. Finally, I'll connect the chip select pin to the Pi's CE0 pin. I'll explain more about that chip select pin when we get to the code. Next, I'll connect the digital ground pin to ground, and then I'll wire up the potentiometer so the ends are connected to the rail and the wiper pin is connected to the first input pin. I'll create a new .NET console app named ADC and open it in my IDE. Next, I'll add the iot.device.bindings NuGet package. Then I'll go to the .NET IoT docs and get the code from the read values from an analog to digital converter tutorial. Let's review the code. I start by creating a new SPI connection settings object. The SPI connection settings object has two parameters, the ID of the SPI bus and the chip select line. Compared to I2C's bus system, SPI employs exclusive I.O. pin access with chip select pins determining the active device for communication. This parameter specifies which of my Pi's chip select pins to activate. Then, just as in the I2C example in the previous videos, I create a new SPI device object using the SPI connection settings object I just created. The SPI device object is the object that actually communicates with the device. After that, I create an MCP3008 object passing in the SPI device object I just created. The MCP3008 object is a wrapper around the SPI device object that makes it easier to read from the ADC. Then I enter the main loop of the program. First I clear the console, then I use the read function to read the value of the channel 0 pin on the MCP3008. The read function returns a value between 0 and 1023, which I then write to the console. Next I divide that value by 10.23 to express the value as a percentage. Then I write that percentage, rounded to the nearest tenth, to the console. Finally, I wait for 500 milliseconds and then repeat the loop. Let's test it out. I've deployed my app, so now I'll run it. I'm starting with my potentiometer turned completely counterclockwise. As I turn it clockwise, the values increase as the voltage to the ADC increases. When I turn it all the way clockwise, the values reach 100%. Likewise, turning counterclockwise reduces the values. Now let's try this with a different ADC. This is an ADS1115. This ADC is 16-bit, so it has more resolution than the MCP3008. It also uses the I2C bus. If you need a refresher on I2C, check out the previous video. I've removed my MCP3008 from my breadboard, but I've left the potentiometer. 
I'll switch the positive voltage from 3.3 volts to a 5 volt pin, and then I'll wire up the SDA and SCL pins. I'll also connect the address pin to ground. This sets the I2C address. Finally, I'll connect the A0 input to the variable output on the potentiometer. Now I'll paste in some code for my ADS1115. You can find this code in the GitHub repository for these videos. This code should look pretty familiar. I start by creating a new I2C connection settings object. The I2C connection settings object has two parameters, the ID of the I2C bus and the address of the device. Since I connected the address pin to ground, the address of the device is this constant, which is 72 in decimal and 48 in hex. Then I create the I2C device object and use it to create an ADS1115 object, specifying input channel 0 and the measuring range of 6.144 volts. Looking at the main loop, you might notice the ADS1115 operates differently from the MCP3008. The read raw function returns values between 0 and 32,767. To ensure that every position on the potentiometer returns a unique value, it's best to use a measuring range greater than the supply voltage. For example, if the potentiometer is supplied with 5 volts, setting the measuring range to 6.144 volts will allow the ADS1115 to measure the full range of the potentiometer without any dead zones. One advantage of the ADS1115 is that I don't need to do any math to determine the voltage. The object has a raw to voltage function that takes the raw value and converts it to a voltage. Like in the previous example, both of these values are written to the console and then the loop repeats after 500 milliseconds. I've deployed the code and I've already enabled my I2C bus, so it's ready to run. As I turn the potentiometer fully clockwise, notice that the raw value never reaches the maximum of 32,767. This is because the measuring range is set to 6.144 volts and the potentiometer is only supplied with 5 volts. The possibilities for analog to digital converters are endless. You can use them to measure temperature, humidity, pressure, and more. As an example, I thought I'd share one of my personal projects. I live in Kansas City, Missouri, USA, and like most Kansas Cityans, I love good barbecue. A few years ago, I bought my own wood pellet smoker so I could learn to smoke my own meat. Unfortunately, the smoker's controller, which controls the rate at which pellets are fed to the fire, was just a simple thermostat. When the temperature drops too low, the controller responds by turning an auger to feed more pellets to the fire. However, due to the lag time between when the fuel is added to the fire and when the temperature rises, the temperature would often overshoot the target. Well, if you know anything about barbecue, you should know that the mantra is low and slow. So I was pretty disappointed that I was having a hard time keeping the temperature close to my target. The solution to this problem is a PID controller. PID stands for Proportional Integral Derivative, and it's a control theory that uses a closed loop to continually adjust the rate of change as a process variable reaches its target. You already use the algorithm every day without even realizing it. If you've used cruise control while driving a car, you've used the PID controller. The controller constantly monitors the speed of the car and adjusts the throttle to keep the speed close to the target speed without overshooting it. I decided to build my own PID controller for my smoker. I based my design off of a similar project, so I can't claim all the credit. However, my solution is, as far as I know, the only project to do it with .NET using the techniques I've shown you in this video series. I control the auger, blower, and igniter using GPIO output to drive relays. An analog to digital converter reads temperatures for the grill and meat probes, and a 20x4 LCD display shows status information. Additionally, I integrated the smoker with my home automation system, Home Assistant, using the MQTT Net library. I can control and monitor my smoker remotely, receive automated notifications when the food is done, and more. The code for my customized smoker, Inferno, is available on this GitHub repo. Instead of reviewing the entire code base, I'll just show you how Inferno monitors temperatures using an analog to digital converter. This is a solderable breadboard. It works just like a regular breadboard, except you can solder components in place to create a permanent circuit. I use this breadboard to test changes to my code without having to push the code to the smoker. You can see the MCP3008 in the middle, and it's wired up mostly like the potentiometer I showed you earlier. The difference is, instead of a potentiometer, I've built a voltage drop circuit. This is very similar to the voltage divider I showed you with the laser receiver in a previous video, but instead of two resistors, I have a resistor and a screw terminal. 
The screw terminal is connected to the smoker's heat probe, which is a special type of thermistor called an RTD, or Resistance Temperature Detector. The MCP3008 channel 0 pin reads the output of the voltage drop circuit. I've included code to read the RTD in the repo for this video series. Let's review it. Let's start with program.cs. I start by reading the appsettings.json file for configuration parameters. I'll talk more about this configuration in a moment. Just as I showed you before, I create a new SPI connection settings object and use that to create an SPI device object. I then use that SPI device object and the configuration object I retrieved earlier to create an object I call RTD probe. The main loop of the program just displays the value of RTD probe's probe temp property every second. Now let's look at RTD probe. RTD probe is a wrapper around the MCP3008. In the constructor, I initialize the ADC, and then I initialize a concurrent queue to store resistance readings from the RTD. Let's come back to that in a minute. Next I read an offset value from the configuration object I passed into the constructor. This is used for fine-grained adjustments to the temperature reading. In the case of this RTD, I know it happens to trend about 9 degrees Fahrenheit too hot, so I set the offset to negative 9. The final thing I do in the constructor is kick off a long-running task called read ADC. Read ADC just loops forever. It reads the ADC, converts the raw value to resistance, and then adds the resistance to the probe resistance's concurrent queue. If there are more than 100 items in the queue, I dequeue the extra items and throw them away. Why am I doing this? Well, the MCP3008, being a 10-bit ADC, can only read values between 0 and 1023. However, the RTD has a resistance range of around 100 ohms to 1000 ohms. That's a huge range, and it's not possible to get a precise reading with a 10-bit ADC. To get around this, I keep the last 100 readings and then average them when the probe temp property is accessed. This gives me a much more precise reading. In retrospect, I could have used a higher resolution ADC like the ADS-1115 or the MAX-31865, which is specifically designed for RTDs, but this solution works well enough. The rest of this is just some math to convert the average resistance to a temperature value. First I calculate the temperature in degrees Celsius using the well-known formula for a two-wire RTD, and then, because I'm American, I convert that value to degrees Fahrenheit. Let's test it. When I first run the program, it correctly detects the ambient temperature as 76 degrees Fahrenheit. RTDs are great for high temperatures, so let's heat it up. That's probably good enough. Now let's cool it back down to freezing. This will take a minute or two to cool to freezing, so I'll speed up the video a bit. There we go. That was fun. This concludes the .NET IoT for Beginners series, at least for now. I had a lot of fun making it, and I hope you found it useful. I tried to include a good sampling of topics, and you should be able to extend these lessons to apply to any of the dozens of IoT devices supported by the .NET IoT libraries. If I missed something that you'd also like to see covered in this series, please let me know in the comments. I'm also the author of the .NET IoT docs, so if you have any topics you want added to the docs, please open an issue on the .NET docs repo. Thanks for watching, happy IoT hacking, and I hope to see you again soon.